Welcome to episode 138 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the tale of Odysseus and part two of the story of Odysseus and the Phaeacians. When the son of Laertes heard his own name celebrated in song, he hid his face in his mantle that no one might see the tears which rose to his eyes. Whenever Demodocus paused, he lifted his head and reached for the cup. But when the singer went on with his story, he again veiled his face. No one noticed this except the king, who sat beside him and heard him heave a deep sigh. Since he did not wish to sadden his guest, he bade the singer put an end to his recital and announced that there were also to be contests in honor of the stranger. Our guest, he said, shall tell his people at home that the Phaeacians excel in rustling and boxing, as well as in jumping and racing. At that, everyone left the board and hastened to the marketplace. There was a throng of noble youths, among them the three sons of Alcinous, Laodamus, Helias, and Cletonius. These three opened the games with a foot race on the sand-strewn course, which stretched as far as the eye could reach. At a given sign, they stormed forward, and the dust swirled under their flying feet. Clitonius soon outstripped his brothers and was first to reach the goal. Next came the wrestling match, and here young Euryalus was victorious. In the jump, Amphilius outdid his rivals. In hurling the discus, Elatrius won, and in boxing, Laodamus, the king's favorite son. Now, Laodamus rose and said to the young men, Should we not ask if the stranger is first in one or another of our sports? His body, his thighs, and his feet promise well. His arms are sinewy, his neck is strong, and he is of powerful build. It is true that hardship and grief have left their mark on him, but he still seems full of the strength of youth. You are right, said Euryalus. Ask him yourself, O prince, and invite him to join in the games. This Laodamus did with courtesy and warmth. But Odysseus replied, Are you doing this to mock me? So nice at my soul, and I have no heart for the games. I worked and suffered enough, and now I want nothing but to return to my native land. Euryalus was ill-pleased with this answer. Stranger, he said, you do not act like a man who is skilled in our games. You are most likely a captain or a merchant, but certainly no athlete. Odysseus frowned at him and said, these are rude words, my friend, and you are a forward boy. But the gods do not give beauty and grace and wisdom and eloquence besides all to one man. Many a person is insignificant to look at, but his words cast a spell, so that all who hear them are enchanted. Such a man stands out in assembly and is honored like an immortal. On the other hand, there are those who look like gods, but their words lack charm and spirit. Still, I know something about contests, and when I was young and strong, I did not hesitate to measure my strength with the boldest. Now, to be sure, battles and sufferings have weakened me, but you have challenged me, and so I shall try. So said Odysseus, and he rose from his seat. Without laying aside his mantle, he chose a discus, larger, thicker, and heavier than any the Phoenician use had thrown, and hurled it with such vigor that the stone hummed through the air. The men near him drew back as he cast, and the discus flew far beyond the target. Quickly Athene, in the guise of a Phaeacian youth, made a mark where it had fallen and cried, A blind man could find this mark, for it is far beyond all the rest. In this contest you will surely be the victor. Odysseus felt glad to think that he had such a true friend among the people and said with a light of heart, Well, young men, cast as far as that if you can. And you over there who insulted me, come here and I shall take part in whatever contest you like. I shall compete with each and every one, but not with Laodamus, for who wants to fight his host? 
My special accomplishment is shooting with the bow, and no matter how many compete with me, I should be the first to hit the target. I know of only one man who could do better than I, Philatetes. He often beat me at Troy when we practiced shooting, and I am just as expert at throwing the javelin. I can cast it as far as another shoots an arrow. But in the foot race, some of you will probably excel me. The sea has sapped too much of my strength, especially those many days I sat on my raft without food. When the young men heard this, they fell silent. But now the king spoke. <laughs> you have shown us your strength, stranger, he said. From this moment on, no one will question your power. But when you sit at home with your wife and children, remember that we too are sturdy and skilled. We are not great boxers and wrestlers, but we are splendid runners and excellent sailors. As for feasting, plucking the strings and dancing, we are past masters at that. With us you will find the most beautiful garments, the most refreshing bath, and the softest couch. Come then, dancers and singers, show this stranger what you can do, so that he may praise you when he reaches his country. And do not forget to bring the lyre of Demodocus. Nine chosen men leveled the ground for the dance and staked off the space for the performance. The lyre player advanced toward the center and the dance began. Boys in the first bloom of youth moved in perfect rhythm, leaping on light feet. Odysseus was filled with wonder. Never had he seen so charming a dance. And the singer, meanwhile, chanted merry episodes from the lives of the gods. When the dance was over, the king bade his son, Laodamus, dance with light Helios. For these two were the best, and no one dared vie with them. They took a purple ball. One leaned backward and threw it high up, and another leapt and caught it in the air before his feet touched the ground again. Then they swung around each other with effortless grace, always casting the ball, and the other young men who formed the circle about them clapped their hands in time. Odysseus was full of admiration. He turned to the king and said, Alcinaeus, you may indeed boast that you have the most agile dancers in the world. There is no one who can surpass your people in this art. Alcinaeus was well pleased with his guest's praise. Did you hear, he called to the Phoenicians, did you hear what this stranger has to say about you? He is a man of good judgment and certainly merits a substantial gift. Each of the twelve princes of our land, and I myself as the thirteenth, shall bring a mantle, a tunic, and a talent of gold. Then let us put all these things together and present them as one parting gift, which will surely gladden his heart. And in addition to this, your Eyeless shall address friendly words to him, so that he may not bear us the slightest grudge. All the Phoenicians loudly acclaimed his words. A herald was sent to collect the gifts, and Euryalus took his sword with a silver hilt and sheath of ivory and offered it to the guest, saying, If I have said anything to offend you, let the winds blow it away, and may the gods grant you a safe journey home. We all wish you welfare and happiness. May you never repent of this gift, said Odysseus, as he slung the beautiful sword over his shoulder. It was sunset by the time the presents were all gathered in and laid before the queen. Alcinaeus asked her for a well-wrought chest, and into this the garments and the gold were laid. Then it was carried into the palace for Odysseus, and the king, who had gone there with all his retinue, added still more sumptuous robes and an exquisite cup of gold. While a bath was being prepared for the guest, the queen showed him the contents of the chest, and then said, See how the lid is fastened, and then close the chest yourself, so that no one can rob you while you sleep. Odysseus closed the lid carefully and secured the chest with intricate knots. Then he refreshed himself in the bath and was just about to join the men who were already seated at the board, when at the entrance to the hall he found Nausicaa standing beside the doorpost. He had not seen her since his arrival in the city, for she kept to the women's chambers apart from the banquets of the men. 
now before his departure she wanted to see the distinguished guest of her house once more she cast a glance of wondering admiration at his tall form and handsome face and detained him gently and said all happiness to you noble stranger and think of me sometimes when you reach the land of your fathers for i have the privilege of saving your life odysseus was deeply moved nausicaa he said if zeus grants me a safe return i shall address you with prayers every day as if you were a goddess with this he entered the hall and took his place at the king's side the servants were just cutting the meat and pouring wine in the cups from the mixing bowl blind demodocus was led and seated himself by the centre pillar of the hall then odysseus summoned the herald cut the best piece from the back of a roasted boar lying in front of him put it on a platter and said herald give this to the singer although this is not my home i should like to do him a courtesy for singers are honored all over the world the muse herself has taught them the art of song and watches over them with favor gratefully the singer received the gift when the meal was over odysseus again turned to demodocus i prize you beyond other mortals he said to him how well you have sung of the fate of the argive heroes as if you yourself had been with them and seen and heard everything now chant us the tale of the wooden horse and the part odysseus had in that adventure joyfully the singer obeyed and all listened to his song when odysseus heard his own praises he again and wept and hid his tears but alcinaeus noticed it he bade the singer be silent and said to the phaeacians better let the lyre rest now for not everyone is enjoying in the tale demodocus has sung our guest is saddened by it and our company does not cheer his heart but a man should love his guest with his brother tell us at last stranger who your parents are and what country you are from everyone whether he be a noble or a common man has a name and if my phaeacians are to take you home we must know the name of your country and of your city that is all they require they do not need a pilot if you only tell them the name of the place they will find their way through fog and darkness at this friendly request the argive hero replied do not think o king that your singer has not pleased me it is delight to listen when such a man lifts his godlike voice and i know of nothing pleasanter than when guests at a feast hang on the words of the singer while they sit at the board heaped with bread and meat and the cupbearer pours wine from the full bowl but now my dear host you wish to hear about me and i fear my own tale is bound to sadden me still more where shall i begin where shall i end but first of all i shall tell you my name and my country and here is where we end our tale for today but i'll be back with more tales many more tales until then my friends enjoy the journey